Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the Bitcoin chart on Bitfinex, and you can see we're sitting at a price of 1174. We just recently hit a new all-time high. I think it was 1350. This doesn't show that price, but my on Bitstamp. Um, so a number of events have happened. Now, if you remember, I talked about a month ago how the Chinese had the Chinese government, the central bank of China, had come in and locked up bitcoins by making it so that you can't withdraw them. They recently extended that decision. They said after 30 days they were going to allow people to withdraw them. They didn't. We're going to read that in the story. But uh, you can see the reaction here. It was a small reaction, but the market drifted down from there, and then the market recovered. And right before this Winklevoss decision was uh, announced, where the SEC rejected the Winklevoss proposal to have a Bitcoin ETF. We're going to read the stories, editorials about that as well. You can see there was that spike to new highs. It was also accompanied by a smash to new lows down around 1050. So you can see the range was 1350 to 1050. That's $300 range in the course of minutes. Then we had the official announcement that the ETF was rejected. And we had, again, this type of uneconomic selling. You can see the price went down to 958 So that's a $400 range. And it snapped back back up to about 1200 You can see we're sitting at 1174 So what is going on? Well, the first thing I wanted to point out is that if you remember, I said that I think I'm going to be right and Bix Weir is going to be wrong. Bix Weir took the position that the move by the Chinese was to simply regulate the exchanges. And this is something we're going to see in a lot of these stories. We need regulation. We need regulation. And it's to regulate the exchanges, to make them fair and all this stuff. Well, that's not what's behind it. I think what's behind it is initially what I said, is the Chinese government taking control of those Bitcoins. We don't know until they decide to allow people to withdraw the coins, whether the coins are even there. And I'll uh, go deeper into that when we read the stories uh, related to these two decisions. Now, the other thing that's very interesting about the reaction to this is the reaction of the rest of the cryptocurrency space. So you can see here that uh, this is a world coin index and we recently hit that high of 25 billion dollar total market cap now bitcoin was over 20 billion in market cap and it's come down a few billion you can see but another very interesting reaction is the reaction in the number two and the number three market cap coins which are now ethereum and dash Ethereum now is to almost a $2 billion market cap, and Dash has just crossed over the $500 million market cap. Dash is formerly Darkcoin. And you can see here on these charts, let's pull up the Dash chart so you can see. After the Chinese and the SEC decisions came down, you can see that Dash has gone up to a price of $75. It hit a high of $75 per Dash. And that's on a volume of about $50 million volume at a market cap of $500 million. So roughly 10% of the market cap turned over. And you can see that that move coincided with these events. So now Darkcoin or Dash uh, is just a different variation uh, with different features. This one has a feature of untraceability more anonymity built into the coin, which of course is needed. But you can see the size of the move from $10 per coin to roughly 72 where we are right now. So a seven fold move in the price of this coin since the beginning of the year. That's the market cap going from under $100 million to a half a billion dollars. Very, very interesting reaction. Now, the other thing I want you to note here is let's just look at these uh, price highs of these different cryptocurrencies. So if we order these, we'll just do it by, well, let's just do it by last price. 
So if we take coins in order of last price, these are the coins that are worth more than the US dollar. If you remember, for most all of these, including Bitcoin, they started off as pennies. Now some of the late IPO coins started off expensive and went down. But again, these are the coins that are worth more than a dollar. Why is that important? Because uh, the dollar is a fiat currency which is being printed to nothing. And these are non-fiat currencies wh whose value is derived from the scarcity of the number of coins. So you can see here at the top, we've got Bitcoin at $1,177. Dash is now $71. Uh, you can see that Zcash is a, is a recent one that's come out. That's another one that has anonymity built into it. $39 a coin there. Ethereum is $21. Uh, this Digix DAO, I don't even know what the coin is. Augur, uh, Fermat, Litecoin is at $3.80. Decred, Factum, Counterparty, Zcoin, Shadow Cash, Ethereum Classic, that's the other side of the fork in Ethereum, YB Coin, and Nubits. All of these coins are worth more than a dollar. They're worth more than the US dollar. The free market has determined that these cryptocurrencies are better than dollars. That's the only conclusion you can come to based on the price. And this is the free market speaking. This isn't government regulation. This isn't governments mandating things. This is the free market. This is people voting with their dollars. Now, let's look at the stories here. Uh, this first story here is about the SEC decision to reject the Bitcoin ETF. I'll talk a little bit about my opinion of that ETF and what I think it's about. But let's read this. This is from an editorial from CryptoCoin News, a person who's very negative on this commissioner, Ailman, who apparently was the sole decider on this. Apparently the SEC commission kind of uh, let this guy make the decision by himself. So here's the editorial. Ailman rejected the ETF because he wants to surveil us. That One of the reasons he cited was regulation. Seemingly ignoring the Fourth Amendment, yet how do we surveil him? Where is the transparency that the SEC so much demands of others? Where is the public record of who this man consulted with? Were the commissioners asked for input? And if not, why not? What are his personal views of Bitcoin? Is he a Democrat? Ailman doesn't even have a profile page at the SEC. He seems to value his own privacy, but not ours. He demands we walk naked while he's fully dressed, hiding deep somewhere inside the gray halls. He most certainly should be fired. The decision document mentions a specific date, data analyzed by the 28th of February. That's almost two weeks ago. Could he have not released the decision then? Did he have to allow so much speculation? Was it an intentional insult to the entire Bitcoin community for this clearly already long ago made decision to be released at the very last hour? Who knew of the decision before it was released? Did any of them trade the market? It is because bureaucrats trade in these sort of insults with their decisions having no accountability, with there being no real checks and balances, with, in effect, one faceless man having so much power, a power which corrupts and is abused, that the public trust in these institutions is at an all-time low. This is an SEC that, demands, that claims to protect the public, yet allows banks to run amok, bankrupting nations such as Greece and giving the millennial generation the worst economic downturn in a century. This is a SEC that claims to protect us, yet holds no one accountable when banks manipulate interest rates, when companies buy their own stocks, when decisions are constantly leaked, and when, when even told about outright fraud such as Bernie Madoff. And it goes into the Madoff story. You know that the SEC was in collusion with that whole thing. One reason for them Another, or one rule for them, another for us. Banks can even manipulate the price of bread, leading to riots in 2008 and perhaps even contributing to the spring revolutions. But they are, uh, they are them. They are out of touch. 
They're the elite. They have different rules, including as good as complete immunity because they're too big to fail. That's why Bitcoin was created. It doesn't have an ailment who unanimously can just decide with no accountability. It doesn't require trust in any individual. Instead, it gives power to decide. Bitcoin is the people's money. Bitcoin, the people's money, is backed by the free market, and it's proved its proposition. Establishment bureaucrats are corrupt. The banks are corrupt. They require complete transparency from us while themselves they're in hiding. They want to know everything about us while revealing nothing about themselves, yet they require us to trust them. And it goes on. So person very angry about that decision. Now, am I angry about this decision? No, not really. Uh, because let's think about it. It, it. It's something similar to what we're seeing in China with the government stepping into the markets there. This is an attempt by these Winklevoss brothers to create a, and there are others, by the way, they're still waiting for a decision from the SEC, to create an ETF where the general public can invest in Bitcoin uh, by depositing dollars, buying the shares of this, which are supposedly invested in a certain amount of Bitcoin. So this is the same issue that we have with silver and gold ETFs. How do we know that they're buying physical gold and silver? Well, they release bar lists, but we've done the videos on the anomalous bar lists, bars listed twice, bars that are listed that someone else owns, uh, bar lists that don't make any sense, that contradict each other. Uh, we have to basically take them at their word that they're investing in this asset. Same thing with a Bitcoin ETF. In my opinion, the only thing that it would do is it would open the door for a lot of money to come flowing into Bitcoin, which might not make it into Bitcoin. Because just as the SLV and the GLD were created to create a way for money to flow into precious metals, but not really go there, actually aid the suppression, I think that this is probably the same thing. So in my opinion, I don't even care. But I'm actually glad that this, uh, this thing wasn't approved. I have no uh, certainty or confidence at all that this money that flows into this ETF would be spent on Bitcoin. So let's look at the next big story, the Chinese decision here. And there's a lot you can read between the lines here of why they did this. Again, remember I said we're going to see who was right. Myself or Bix Weir? Bix Weir is telling us the Chinese bank, the Central Bank of China, the government of China are the good guys and they're going to regulate and make sure Bitcoin's an honest market. I'm telling you they're just bankers just like all the rest who are controlled by the power elite and this is an attempt, another attempt to suppress Bitcoin and let's read this article. You'll see it kind of hinted at here. Barely a few days before the expected resumption of withdrawals by the big Chinese exchanges, a statement by OKCoin indicated an imminent extension of the suspension. In a statement to users on Wednesday, OKCoin said, once the regulatory authorities have given their approval, you may withdraw currency. Well, that's not, that wasn't the issue. Uh, the issue was withdrawing Bitcoin. They were st they're still allowing the withdrawal of the currency. A lot of Bitcoin users now think that the decision concerning the resumption of withdrawals is dependent upon the timing and decision of the PBOC. Contrary to this assumption, active participants in the Chinese Bitcoin community, as well as BitLock's director Dana Ko, tell Cointelegraph that the present suspension may have been misunderstood by a lot of people as most users in China have carried on with their normal business. Ko says, I don't really see a huge disruption for the majority of the users. The selling of Bitcoins and withdrawal of RMB is not impeded at all. Okay, do you see that? That sentence says it all. So what are they doing? They're allowing the selling of Bitcoins and the withdrawal of RMB. They are not allowing the buying of Bitcoins with RMB and the withdrawal of the Bitcoins. Just like I said before, it's a one-way market. The way they shut down the market on the hunts, they're allowing people to buy Bitcoins but not withdraw them. So the question comes up, if they're allowed to buy Bitcoins, how do they know they really are buying Bitcoins? Well, they don't. 
There's no way they can know. In fact, the government of China could have seized all of the Bitcoins that were on those exchanges and has been dumping them into market rallies on the Western exchanges. And uh, remember that the central banks have as much RMB as they want to print. So uh, what they've done is they've made it so that everybody in China can only sell Bitcoins, which will obviously depress the price. According to Ko, most Chinese participants in the Bitcoin community are interested in Bitcoin for its value in trading and arbitrage. Most users of the Chinese exchanges deposit RMB so that they may purchase Bitcoins and take advantage of market movements as any gains are normally converted back to RMB or held on the exchange as Bitcoins. Again, do you see that? The same issue. Uh, secondly, arbitrage. You cannot arbitrage the market if you can't withdraw the Bitcoins. If I'm on OKCoin OK and Bitcoins are cheaper there than Huobi, and I buy my cheap Bitcoins on OKCoin OK and I want to sell them on the other exchange, if I can't withdraw the coins, then I can't arbitrage the markets. So that's a ridiculous argument. It's impossible to arbitrage if you can't get the Bitcoins off the exchange. And again, this is what they want you to do, convert it back to RMB and they say, or held on the exchange as Bitcoins. Well, obviously, if you can't withdraw any Bitcoins from the exchange, then you don't know if there are any Bitcoins on the exchange. They might just be giving you a number in an account that they say represents Bitcoins. There's no way for you to know. However, Co notes that even though it may be an inconvenience for users to not take their profits in Bitcoins, it's only appropriate to wait and see what sort of plan the Chinese regulators and exchanges will come up with. Quote, it appears they are negotiating for a plan, but it's difficult to say what such a plan will look like as the motives of the regulators is somewhat unclear. Yeah, that's an understatement. I think it's pretty clear what their motives are. And we're going to see here uh, in this uh, paragraph below. Ko continues by telling Cointelegraph of his suspicion that regulators in China may want to reduce over leveraging and what they call excess speculation. The rationale behind this is they do not want to be blamed and or asked to reimburse losses from risky trades or system failures. Well, that's ridiculous. All they have to do is just simply say the, the Bank of China, the People's Bank, will not be responsible for any losses on any exchanges, and that's it. They're done. So that's a stupid excuse. Regulators want a reduction of such horror stories where people lose their shirts from 20 times leveraging or not being able to get onto a website so as to sell into a stop loss capacity. This development in Ko's opinion is in the long run a good thing for, for Bitcoin in China as stories about sensational losses always scare people. Again, here's the call for more regulation. Well, we don't need regulation. We need free markets. And if people uh, are losing money because of they can't trust the markets that are out there that is what's going to drive innovation that's what's going to drive uh peer-to-peer -peer, uh decentralized exchanges which is a possibility as i pointed out in in another video it's theoretically possible for that to exist it just has to be done the software has to be written someone has to implement it and people taking losses is what's going to drive it Another aspect that Co observes is the regulation of exchanges in that they must have transparent volume reporting. This, he says, is healthy for the whole Bitcoin system as a more accurate picture can be drawn for volumes. Well, I, I agree there should be accurate volumes, but you can't trust the government. The government's the one that creates fake volumes. Co concludes by saying, when the exchanges resume withdrawals of Bitcoin, I have some serious doubts if that will ever happen. I expect it will be heavily encumbered with some sort of quota or reporting system as China has rather strict controls on the amount of currency that may be taken out of the country. So there it is. There's the real reason capital flight. The Chinese are afraid of people buying Bitcoin with their RMB and withdrawing the Bitcoin outside of the country. But again, Bitcoin is not a currency. So they really don't have any authority to do that. So what did they do? They shut down the exchanges and prevented people from getting their Bitcoins off the exchanges. So again, very disingenuous by this author as well as by the People's Bank of China. It's very clear what's going on here in my mind. Uh, the Chinese government is trying to stop the rise of Bitcoin, just like all of the other banks in the world, Western or not. 
Now, here's another government that's fighting Bitcoin, and this is ridiculous. Talk about shooting yourself in the foot. Here's a country that could actually be saved by Bitcoin. And this just goes to show you that the bankers, the Illuminati, the powers that be, the monsters, the Satanists that control our world, they're in control of all of these countries. And Venezuela is just another one. Bitcoin mining is big business in Venezuela, but the government wants to shut it down. Now think about what would happen if Venezuela adopted Bitcoin as its official currency. Can you imagine how rich Venezuelans would become overnight if the government of Venezuela uh, wrote into their constitution that Bitcoin is as good as the official currency, it's legal, it's recognized, it's unregulated, and businesses are allowed to do business there. You would see so much capital flowing into that country uh, it would go from being poor to rich overnight. Caracas, Venezuela. Venezuela has become widely known as an economic basket case in recent years, but with its cheap electricity and volatile national currency, the country has at least one competitive advantage. It's a good place to make digital cash known as Bitcoin. Bitcoins are increasingly accepted online for buying real-world goods and services. And unlike the Venezuelan Bolivar, the virtual currency has been going up in value. Making Bitcoins is known as mining, but it requires a powerful computer instead of pick and shovel. Those computers produce Bitcoins by creating elaborate algorithms, but they also suck up a lot of electricity. In many countries, the cost of running a mining terminal can run higher than the value of the actual Bitcoins. That's not the case in cash-poor, oil-rich Venezuela, where state-subsidized electricity is so cheap it's virtually free. But Venezuela's government isn't pleased. It's cracking down on Bitcoin mining, even though the country has no laws on the books outlawing the currency or its manufacture. In November, Venezuela's secret police raided the house of two brothers in Caracas and found more than 90 mining terminals. The agents demanded $1,000 in bribes. That's typical of socialist governments. Uh, their agents need bribes because they can't afford to pay them hard currency. Bribes for each machine, according to the brothers who spoke on the condition of anonymity because they fear arrest. The brothers said they paid the bribes to stay in business. This isn't an isolated case, and such operations appear to be expanding. In January, Venezuelan federal police arrested four Bitcoin miners in the town of Sharalov. Uh, I can't pronounce that. They were accused of internet fraud and electricity theft. According to an Instagram post published by Douglas Rico, the director of the federal police agency CICPC, the miners were endangering the stability of the town's electrical services. During the same week, Edward and Eric Tapia Salas were arrested in Caracas for selling Bitcoin mining machines through a Venezuelan e-commerce site. Miners have taken to websites such as Reddit to share their fears of being caught. Miners are getting jailed and accused of terrorism, money laundering, and computer crimes, and many other crimes. Read one comment from a user who claims to be Venezuelan. It's getting crazy here, and I really don't want to waste my life or money. Those who keep mining in Venezuela they said they have started taking extreme precautions to hide their activities. Luis Luon, 25, a business student and Bitcoin miner, said miners have learned not to keep all of their computers in one place. If they do, the state power corporation can detect the abnormal amount of electricity the mining terminals use. That was the brothers' mistake. They were consuming 20 times the normal level of electricity for the house. Venezuela's crackdown on the Bitcoin industry started in March 2016 with the arrest, and it goes on. So there you go. Stupid governments trying to shut down Bitcoin. Uh, you've got the Venezuelan psychopathic socialists. You've got the Chinese communists. You've got the American communists, the SEC, uh, which I don't really care what they do either way. And then again, we have the price of Bitcoin powering higher. Uh, the two attempts that we've just had recently to crack the price, again, we've had uneconomic selling. That's selling where you're trying to get the worst price, not the best price. Uneconomic selling here, taking the price on Bitfinex all the way down to 950 from a recent high of 1350. Uh, there's no question in my mind that this is governments attempting to suppress the price of Bitcoin any way they can. Ultimately, they will fail. 
in my mind, it's a mathematical certainty, just as much as it's a mathematical certainty that cryptocurrencies are the future. And we'll talk to you next time.